Thanks everyone and welcome to the DC Environmental Film Festival, the environmental film festival in the nation's capital. We're here to discuss the last of the right whales with a great panel and I'm going to introduce them and then we'll dive right into questions. We have Nadine Pequeniza, uh, thank you. We have Nadine Pequeniza, who's the director of The Last of the Right Whales. She's an award-winning producer, director, and writer who's made films on a wide range of topics from criminal justice to global finance to wildlife conservation. Dr. Moira Brown is the lead scientist at the Canadian Whale Institute. Dr. Brown has been studying North Atlantic right whales for over 30 years in both Canadian and US waters. In 2015, when right whales were first observed in large numbers in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, she and other researchers determined that these whales had left feeding grounds in the Bay of Fundy and the Gulf of Maine. We have Martin Noel, a fisherman who's featured in the film. In the Gulf of St. Lawrence, uh, snow crab fisher Martin Noel is conducting the first real world test of ropeless fishing technology in the North Atlantic. Dr. Sarah Sharp is a veterinarian for the International Fund for Animal Welfare. Dr. Sharp is the animal rescue veterinarian for IFA's Marine Mammal Rescue and Research Program. Dr. Sharp leads IFA's efforts to document the causes of death for all marine mammals on and around Cape Cod, Massachusetts, including the endangered North Atlantic right whales. So uh, welcome to all of you. And I'm excited about this discussion, having seen the film, and uh, it's great to be able to delve into greater depth in some of these issues. I, I wanted to start with the issue of rope, which is obviously something that all of you have dealt with, and which is um, you know, something that, that's obvious, the issue of entanglement is, is a major topic for this film. And specifically at one point, there's a comment about, you know, what can be done to address the threats to white whales, where uh, one, of, one of the subjects in the film says, I'm talking about reducing rope, not reducing fishing. And I was wondering if a, a few of you could talk about this, perhaps, uh, Martin, you could, you could talk about what's, what you've seen in your own experience testing this new technology as well as you know, some of the experts could, could just get into to what extent is rope the biggest problem facing the North Atlantic right whales as opposed to say vessel strikes and other issues we see. But so Martin, do you think you could talk a little about what you've seen in your experience so far? Yeah, thank you very much. So, uh, you know, everything started for us in 2017. We never seen, I've never seen a right whale before. And, and you know, that situation came up and, and it, it came after in 2018 with closures and, and you know, um, we could not, you know, fish in certain grounds where right whales were. So it pushed us uh, to find some solution and understand what was happening with the whales and our fishery. So we had to try some solution like the on-demand system, like ropeless, to mitigate or, or to diminish the, uh, the impact of the, uh, our fishery on the right whales. So, so it was a, a, a very new situation for us. We had to learn a lot. And thank you for people like Mo Brown that I also met for the first time in 2017. But you know, it was a it was a very uh, uh, situ a very hard situation for us because we it was a new uh, new problem in our area. So we never faced something like that. So a lot changed since that, and uh, with the closures and the new uh, technology that we're trying to use there, and we're we're just arriving. We're just in a, in, a, in a meeting, a two day meeting, and these days that are talking about uh, new technology and new ways to address this to uh, have less rope uh, or, or problems where the whales are. So that's uh, a lot of, of, of uh, interesting uh, new ways are done for the, by the fishermen in Canada. Got it. Um, would, would someone else on the panel wanna to, to talk about, you know, how you see rope as uh, ranking among the threats and, and how doable it is to change things? Sure, I'm happy to jump in. Um, so I was just going to say from our work um, and the work of a lot of our colleagues documenting the dead North Atlantic right whales, um, we've taken off a lot of line from these animals um, and entanglement certainly is uh, the greatest threat to these whales right now. Vessel strikes are still a threat. 
um, but entanglement is still kind of the leading cause at this point. Um, and what we do know from decades and decades of, of doing this work and, and the research of folks like Mo um, that are out on the water is that anytime there's line in the water and anytime that overlaps with the whales, that that is when there, there is an issue. So it's not specific to fishing gear necessarily. Um, and the great work that Martine and, and other folks that are really pioneering this ropeless fishing is really going to show that um, there are ways that we can solve this problem that are creative and it really doesn't have to be a whales versus the fishing industry or versus the, the shipping industry kind of issue. So when you, when you watch the film, you probably notice that right whales had a pattern on the top of their head and that's called a callosity pattern. And researchers can use that to distinguish between individuals. And so that means when we photograph a whale anywhere between Florida and the Gulf of St. Lawrence, we'll add that photograph to the catalog and that whale's life history. So we know a lot about these individuals. We can also monitor the acquisition of new scars. And we have a pretty good idea of what scars on the whale's body look like when they've been in contact with fishing, uh, fishing gear, rope. Uh, so 85% of the catalog whales have uh, scars from at least a single entanglement and, and another 50%, uh, a second one. And we even have one poor whale that looks like it's been interacting with gear seven different times over its life. And so we knew about rope. We certainly don't see that high a percentage of entangled whales. They interact with the rope. They Sometimes they break free, uh, which is the great scenario. And if they don't, then we have teams like uh, our Campobello Whale Rescue Team that can go out and, and, and try and disentangle the whales. And we're expanding that team membership to some of the crab fishermen up in Shippigan to help us disentangle the whales because they really understand their fishing gear. And, and we work with them to teach them about whale behavior. So it's a really good effort to, to work together to try and solve the problem. The, the one that you saw in the film, uh, 4615, that was a whale that, that we saw at noontime that didn't have an entanglement and, and it did four hours later. And so we have a lot of resources to bring to that to try and track that animal and, and, and figure out how to try and disentangle it. it. It doesn't always work. And that's why in order to have a good coexisting relationship between fisheries and, and, and whales, the whole concept of getting rope out of the water uh, in the areas where there are whales uh, has come about. And, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's really hard to do. Uh, it's a new technology for the fishermen. They've been doing what they've been doing for years and they're good at it. And to build a whole new technology into recovering your deer, uh, you have to figure out the safety elements as, as well as are you gonna catch uh, as many crab or fish as you did before. So working together on this, I think is, the, is, is gonna lead us towards a solution that's gonna help this animal recover. And do you and I, oh, go ahead, sorry. So I was just gonna add from the perspective of the film, like all of these people here uh, were in the film, are in the film, you know, doing their respective roles uh, to save this species or protect it. And one of the things that I wanted, you know, in approaching this issue, we hear a lot about entanglement. Um, it's reported all the time in the press, but I don't think people really, understand, I didn't understand until we came across 4615, that young male, a five-year-old male, and that was actually a second entanglement, but it was a fresh entanglement that we were witnessing. So what happens, you know, in the hours after a whale is first entangled? And it's really eye-opening to see uh, how traumatic and violent that interaction is, because if you think about it, you know, this, this rope is often attached to weighted gear on the bottom and whales need to breathe. And so they react quite violently when they're trying to get loose of this gear. And um, I think in seeing this, it brings an appreciation for what the problem actually is. Got it. And when you look at it again, obviously, so there, there's this initial work to try to devise, you know, this solution on fishing. When you look at kind of what all of you see as the, you know, kind of critical next steps, the obstacles that might need to be overcome or what it will take to really do this on a larger scale. What, what do you see as a kind of a near-term path forward to tackle this issue? Well, I think the first step is getting the gear in the hands of fishermen and getting it in the water to see if it can be fished safely and to see if they can uh, catch an equivalent number of of crab or fish, whatever their, their target species is, because that's that's an important part of this coexistence. And I would I would actually just like to, to add one thing is that 
this was not a problem in the Gulf of St. Lawrence before about 2015, simply because the whales were in the Bay of Fundy in the summertime and most of the fisheries are, are winter fisheries there. So there wasn't an entanglement problem. In the US there was for sure, and in other parts of Canada, and it, and it was dealt with with gear modifications over time. But all of that has still led us to believe that the trick is getting rope out of the water. Because if rope is in the water, there is still a, a, a risk to the, to the whales. And so getting, uh, getting experiments uh, underway and, and figuring out how this can be done so that the fishermen can fish safely, and the whales can, can coexist with the fishermen in the same area without a risk of entanglement is the long-term goal. Uh, I think we're making good progress towards that, but it's gonna take some time. And so in the meantime, we'll still do things like disentangle whales, uh, but we really wanna be put out of business. We don't wanna be disentangling whales anymore. It's too dangerous. Yeah, I have to agree with Mo <laughs> that uh, everything that she said is, is the, the, the line of view, of view that we have in the fishery, like I have to say as an example, in 2022, there's going to be at least 21 fishermen using that ropeless gear or on-demand gear with a, a large number of, of, of crab pots to be deployed in the Gulf of San Lorenzo in the closed zone. So uh, that represents a quarter, 25% uh, of the uh, the fishermen, uh, the midshore fishermen fleet. So that's a very important number of fishermen that's going to be using new technology to, to find the solution to coexist with the right whales in the Gulf of San Lawrence. So I think that's a, a very big step for our industry. And uh, by seeing the number of fishermen participating, I think that we have a clear sign that uh, uh, we have a good intention in this situation. Great, and I wanted to ask Nadine, maybe you can take this question first, but you know, one of the interesting issues for anyone who's involved in issues that involve the ocean is making something visible that again, many people do not see. And clearly that's part of what this film is trying to do, both in terms of, again, what's happening with the whales themselves and the folks who are working on the water, whether it's working to disentangle them, working in terms of on these fishing vessels, can you talk a little about what you were doing and, and kind of the task that you were presented when you're trying to illuminate what's happening here? And, and you know, again, what, what might have been some of the toughest things that you were doing as, as you were filming and also, you know, what you felt like was the most critical that you captured? Yeah, well, it was extremely challenging. You know, this is a critically endangered whale. So there's lots of protection measures. You can't get within 100 meters in Canada and 500 yards in the United States unless you have a federal permit. So that was the first challenge. And, you know, we achieved that by working with scientists like Moira Brown, uh, with Sarah and her uh, crew at IFA and different government organizations. So once we had the permits, that was step one. And then of course, step two is filming on the water is always challenging. You know, you have to have good weather, you have to have calm seas, and then you have to find the whales and there's only a few hundred left. So that is also challenging when their range is so great, you know, all the way from Florida to the Gulf of St. Lawrence. But we are lucky to have aerial surveys. Um, these whales are well studied as Mo was saying earlier, you know, they're checking each individual history of the whales, even generations over three family generations. So they're well studied. They know where they are for the most part. Um, and so that helped us in locating the whales and filming them. And then you can't dive with these whales either. So that was not <laughs> open to us. So it's really a lot of aerial drone photography. So then we are looking for the animals when they're spending a lot of time at surface. So that's mom calves you know, in the calving grounds off the coast of Florida, we filmed there two seasons, skim feeding, which is a unique behavior they do in Cape Cod Bay uh, because the plankton they eat is right at the surface. And then surface active groups um, was another behavior that we are looking to film again, because the whales spend a lot of time at the surface. So, so that's how we accomplish the imagery, which really you can't, you can't encourage people to want to protect something if they don't know what it is. Um, and so like Martin said, you know, he had never seen a right whale until 2017 when they came to the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And we have to assume that's gonna be the case for most audiences. And so we really wanted people to have an appreciation for this animal because they are, you know, magnificent, really majestic, curious. They're just so wonderful to watch. I mean, I could watch the footage for hours, but that's, that's what we set out to do when we made the film. 
I'm wondering if, if, if anyone else wants to comment. I mean, again, you all have been working in this space for a long time. And on one level, of course, you know, plenty of whether it's people living in the United States or Canada are aware of North Atlantic right whales, but it's but it obviously is a fairly abstract concept. And I'm wondering what it's like to try to convey your work to a public or policymakers when obviously they are unlikely to have firsthand experience that say someone who's out fishing would have. Yeah, absolutely. I think that one level is that people don't really see these whales very much. They aren't the whales that generally people are going out on whale watches and watching. That's usually humpback whales. Um, and so these guys are a little bit uh, harder for people to see and harder to access. And then you add on the layer of that where we're, we are watching these animals suffer from these injuries from, from entanglements and from vessel strikes. And so it's, it's really, it adds another layer of difficulty on because people are, are not even aware that these animals are there. They don't know them at all. And then trying to explain to them that actually they're suffering from these horrible human induced injuries um, is, is a really challenging thing to convey and to make people care about. So things like this film really help get that message across. When you watch that whale struggle in that gear, there's no question in your mind that that animal is in distress and is suffering from that interaction. Um, and so I think modes like this, videos um, and documentaries that can really get across not only who these whales are, but then the challenges and the, um, the obstacles that they're facing in their marine environment that we are actually responsible for. Um, that's kind of another piece to the puzzle that is really hard to convey, but, but documentaries like this definitely help. Okay. And um, there is a lot of crying in this film, uh, obviously, you know, from a, a range of different people who are involved. I mean, there, there is an element um, of sadness that, that pervades kind of th this entire issue. And I'm just wondering if any of you can speak to what, it, what that's, that's like to both be engaged in it and also try to draw people out and, and have them, you know, document what, what, it's, what it's like to, to work on this. You know, because we can identify these whales as individuals, mother calf pairs, some years we've had grandmothers, mothers and daughters all with their own calves in the Bay of Fundy in years past. Uh, it really is an insight when you can see them as individuals, as families. We've been sampling their skin to do genetic studies. We even know who the fathers are in some cases and maybe the whales don't even know who their fathers are. So, so that's kind of you know something very special. And you know, when you see an animal punctuation, for example, in the movie, I mean, when, when, when that whale was found, I mean, you just, you think about the legacy, you think about the offspring and her family, and you think about what's lost to the future, the loss of her future calves. Uh, that, when, you, when you spend your lifetime studying these whales in all these different habitat areas, uh, you know, it definitely hits home. Um, our, our research group spans two countries, uh, government, academics, NGOs, environmental groups, and we all work together to try and give this animal a chance. And that has expanded in, in the last 20 years to the fishing industry and the shipping industry. Nobody wants to see these whales go extinct. Uh, it's a really hard problem. And, and we haven't talked much about vessel strikes, but, but we, we all work with the shipping industry as well. So there, I would say a lot of credit goes to the folks on the water, the fishermen and, the, and, and, the, and those on the ships who are changing the way they go about their daily operations to make room for right whales. Uh, we can help them figure out the problem. We understand the whales, they know their operations uh, and they're the ones that are changing their way about doing things to give this animal uh, a little more room to thrive. And are, are there any ways in which, um, and Martin, maybe you can speak to this, but that where where too much is being asked of, of folks who are on the water, do you feel like the, the, you know, this is a challenging situation and is it realistic what, what's being asked of, of you and others at this point? Well, as you say, it's really a challenging situation because we have a really short uh, duration for our fishery, 10 to 12 weeks. And then the whales are arriving in May and June, so it's uh, in our uh, the timing of our season. So one of the aspects that might be very difficult for us is to to evaluate new ways of doing things that are not already approved or you know uh, proven to be uh, safe for the fishermen and safe for the whales. So we we want to investigate more on some items, 
But we know that some are, and we're working with them, like on the demand system, we know that we think that these are very promising. So we would like to push more on the things that works for our fishery and maybe uh, delay a bit on some things that we do not know that's going to work. So, so there's two levels here. But the thing is, what's really important at the end of the day is that everybody collaborates. And instead of finger pointing people, uh, the government, uh, fishermen, the scientists, NGOs, we all talk together and try to find a, a solution to coexistence. That's the, I think that this, it is a key element that I think that I saw from 2017 in Canada. And I think that's the, the, the thing that helped us to, to, to go forward. And for me to be able to, to uh, be, to see the whales in the summertime in the survey with, with uh, groups like Mo and uh, the Canadian Wood Institute and the New England Aquarium, uh, we, I, I am learning and we are lear learning as an industry uh, the behavior and where the whales are. Because when we're fishing, we're not looking for whales. Our objective is to fish crab. But now today, we need to do two things. We need to, to catch our crab and, and find a way to protect the whales. So it's a different thing for us. It's added stuff. So it's a learning curve, but I think with everybody collaborating in this, I think we're, we're maybe not going as fast enough for some people, but I do believe that in our side, we're doing everything we can so that we can achieve our goals. Thanks so much. And, and thanks to everyone for staying around for this discussion and attending the DC Environmental Film Festival. We appreciate it. And thanks so much to uh, all of our panelists for sharing their, their thoughts and views on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.